Good morning, ladies. Um, good morning. You all survived the pollen to, <laughs> to make it in here this morning, or still surviving the pollen. Hopefully last night's rain, we're getting to the end of it. But this morning, we're going to take up um, the last chapter in the Gospel of John, chapter 21, that recounts Peter's restoration and most importantly, our Lord's command to follow him. What a tremendous year we have had studying this gospel, haven't we? John's incredible portrait of Jesus compels us to behold, to look at Jesus, to believe who he is, and to follow him. We have seen Jesus teaching, healing, loving, interceding, and sacrificing himself for his own. And now, at the close of the story, John invites us to look at Jesus one final time, to behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, to believe to, that these are written, that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, and to follow him. We hear this message over and over again in the book of John and how fitting it is that he ends his story, this last chapter, with this same message. So before we begin, let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So ladies, if you'll turn in your Bibles to um, John chapter 21, we're going to look at verses uh, 1 through 8 first. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the, to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, have you any fish? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. Jesus, in his resurrected body, has already appeared three times in John's Gospel, twice to the disciples and once to Mary Magdalene. He has instructed them to go on to Galilee, telling them he will see them there. And so this chapter opens with the disciples in this in-between state, post Jesus' resurrection and before Pentecost. And so they return to what they know how to do. Simon Peter, the leader of the band, says he's going fishing, and the other disciples follow him. Some commentators have speculated that given Jesus' scandalous death, benefactors who supported his ministry may have disappeared, uh, forcing the disciples back to their ordinary occupations to provide for their daily needs. Others say this return to fishing rather than waiting on Jesus denotes an apostasy of some sort. They're returning to what they were doing before they met him as if all of this had never happened. However, there is no evidence in the chapter that what they were doing was wrong. They had, in fact, been obedient to the Lord by going to Galilee as, they, as Jesus had instructed them to, and they were providing for their needs, albeit unsuccessfully. A man appears to them on the beach, and we are not told why they can't tell it is Jesus. Perhaps it's morning, perhaps there's mist, perhaps it's just hidden from them. But he calls out to, to them, with a better translation being, Lads, lads, haven't you caught any fish? When they respond negatively, he instructs them to let down the nets again, and this time they are successful. Instinctively, or perhaps recalling a uh, time previous that is chronicled in Luke chapter 5, when Jesus calls the disciples initially, the beloved disciple, who is John, the author of this gospel, cries out, It is the Lord. The Greek word he uses for Lord there is kyrios, 
The same Greek word Thomas uses in chapter 20, when upon seeing Jesus' hands and sides, he exclaims, my Lord and my God. The definition of Kyrios is a person exercising absolute ownership rights, or he to whom a person or thing belongs, about which he has the power of deciding, master or lord. And this is the term that the, was most, most commonly used in the New Testament to designate Jesus. Jesus' miraculous provision of the fish, and this was the second time they had experienced this creative miracle in the disciples' lives, provokes from John this recognition and assessment, it is the Lord. Simon Peter, never one to let grass grow under his feet, immediately jumps in the water and begins swimming to shore. It is this recognition and appreciation of who Jesus is that we have seen all throughout John's Gospel. And this, once folks recognize who he is, it compels them to action. To those who believe compelling them to action and support the Samaritan woman, remember in chapter 4, she goes back to her village and she tells everybody, come and see a man who told me all that I've ever done. Is this the Messiah, right? And then Jesus stays two more days and a quantity of people come to believe in him. But also it compels people to action who don't believe in him and um, compelling them, the Jewish leaders and Pharisees, to murder him and to try and stop him by whatever means available to them. Most readily available to them was Roman rule and authority. John, poetically and beautifully, lays out this first principle of beholding Jesus in the prologue to his gospel. See who Jesus is, recognize and know his worth. When he says that, he lays this out when he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is God. Behold Him. Look and see and know. The Word became flesh, became a man from Nazareth. And sometimes even good things can come from Nazareth, despite what Nathaniel thought in chapter 1 of God's, John's Gospel in verse 49. But then when Jesus said, what did He say? I saw you under the fig tree. What Nathaniel, Nathaniel has the correct assessment. Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. He recognizes who Jesus is. Nathaniel had an encounter with Jesus and rightly re assessed his worth. And there he is that morning with the disciples on the beach, right where he's supposed to be. My ask of you ladies this morning is, as we have worked through this gospel, have you beheld Jesus? Have you really looked at him? Have you seen his infinite worth, his beauty, his grace, his self-sacrifice? Have you beheld him as God's word, God's gracious self-disclosure to us, the absolute perfection that he is? So let's look at verses 9 through 14. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on, laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. As the scene continues, Jesus, as was said in chapter 18, continues to love his own disciples even to the very end. And in this instance, he is providing food for them and also, I think, comfort. Unable to provide food for themselves, Jesus has already, already has breakfast waiting for them on the beach, he's cooking it and invites them to join him. What a model for us today. We know that it is Christ who loves and provides for his church out of his abundance and provides for us individually. We are always able to receive through him what we need to live our lives, to serve him and to serve others. The provision is never ours. We never start it, and we never provide for ourselves. 
We come to him with nothing, nothing but a heart willing to serve him, and he provides all that we need. Verses 15 through 19 are perhaps some of the most poignant in the entirety of John's gospel. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death Peter was to glorify God. Oh my gosh, how lovingly and specifically Jesus restores Peter. The seven are gathered, they have finished eating, and now Jesus turns to Peter and in front of all of them says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? The Greek doesn't specify what the antecedent is to these. Does Jesus mean, does Peter love him more than the other disciples? Or does he mean more than he does fishing? Does it mean that he loves him more his, than his life previous to Christ? Or could he mean, does Peter love Jesus more than all the other disciples love him? Peter is their leader, and he failed miserably in the, in the darkest hour. What is Jesus asking him to do now? Perhaps Jesus is asking him to love him more than all of those things. If Peter is to lead, if he is the one to proclaim the gospel on the first day of Pentecost with such boldness, confidence, and power of the Holy Spirit, such that 3,000 people are converted, then he must love Jesus more than he loves anyone else, more than he loves his own life, and perhaps in some way more than the other disciples do. Jesus is choosing Peter to be the one to lead means that he must bear that weight and mantle of responsibility. So he asked him the same question three times, matching, of course, the number of Peter's denials. Commentators point out the differences in the verbs that Jesus uses for love compared to Peter, with Jesus using the verb form of agape and Peter using a form of phileo. We most often connote agape with the unconditional love that God has for us. But in the Gospel of John, it can also be used negatively, such as in John 3:19, people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. The root form of agape is used in this sentence and also again in John 12:43, where we re read that the Jewish religious leaders loved praise from men more than from God. Again, agape is the verb that is used. For this reason and other stylistic nuances in John, um, two of the commentators that the teaching leaders have relied on this year assert that John is merely using synonyms as the two verbs for love are used and using them interchangeably. What is most important, however, is our Lord's gracious love for, restoration of, and repurposing of Peter. Jesus publicly allows Peter to recant his previous denials and provides a prophecy detailing that in fact Peter would serve him faithfully and it would cost him his life. Think about and remember how this scene mirrors the one in the upper room where Peter pledges his love and then Jesus prophesies that Peter would deny him three times before the rooster crows. Here again Peter pledges his love and this time Jesus tells him that yes, he would remain faithful to martyrdom. Have you considered that Peter lived for 30 plus years with that knowledge hanging over his head? Peter, the great denier, the one who swore both profusely and profanely that he did not know Jesus, would some 30 odd days later say, empowered by the Holy Spirit and in a crowded Jerusalem full of religious pilgrims, Men of Israel hear these words. 
Jesus, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. He would later conclude his sermon with, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And that is Acts 2. I strongly encourage you to go home and read Acts 2 after this and think about the evolution of Peter, Peter's walk with the Lord. Jesus restores and repurposes Peter from the great denier to the great preacher. Looking at Peter, we are reminded once again that it is the Lord's love for us that changes us and has transforming ability or transforming power so that we are able to faithfully serve him whatever that looks like in our lives. God's love shapes us, forms us, and molds us so that we can be pleasing to him. And we are so, I personally am so thankful, as you are too, for that fact. Peter's life would come to exemplify what John has been teaching us so clearly throughout his gospel. Belief, real saving belief in Jesus Christ prompts action. Belief is demonstrated through obedience. Jesus restored Peter, and Peter obeyed the call of his Lord. From chapter 3, verses 35 and 6, we read, John writes, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Again, we see belief, and its opposite is disobedience. Did you know that John uses the term believe more than any other of the gospel writers? In fact, he uses it 98 times in his gospel, and this is more than all the other synoptic writers combined. In fact, his gospel contains almost one-third of all the uses of the, in the entire Bible. John doesn't want us to just believe, though. For him, as I said before, saving belief is manifested through obedience. So we've looked at behold, and we have looked at believe, and now the last point from John's gospel, both from this chapter and the gospel in its entirety, is follow. So for that, let's turn to the last portion of John, verses 20 through 25. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who had been reclining at table close to him and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he should remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now there are many other things Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. From the text, it appears that Jesus and Peter have broken away from the other disciples and are walking down the beach with John following them. Jesus has told Peter what type of death he is going to die from. In that day, to stretch out one's hands was commonly a phrase commonly used to denote crucifixion. So when Jesus said he was going to stretch out his hands, he knew that he would be crucified. So Peter was aware of what was coming his way. And then what does Jesus say to him? He doesn't really provide a word of comfort in that immediate moment. No, what is most important is that he commands Peter to follow him. What would be most important to Peter's life would be his willingness to follow Christ, no matter where that path led him. To follow in the Greek means uh, properly to be in the same way with as on a road to accompany. It also means to cleave steadfastly to one, to conform wholly to his example in living and if need be in dying also. Peter would live for, for Christ from this point forward and he would die for him too. 
It is interesting to note that Peter's wife was executed at the same time he was as well. Of course, Peter being Peter immediately asked, what about John back there? What's going to happen to him? And I think that is so like us, always being concerned about what someone else has or does instead of steadfastly focusing on the one who matters. But Jesus, undeterred by Peter's question, I believe probably stopped walking and turned at look, looked at him dead in the eye and said, what is that to you? I want you to follow me. It's an emphatic usage of the verb, so much so that in your Bible you will note that our Lord's command is followed by an exclamation point, you follow me. That emphatic command is as much for us today as it was for Peter then. We are to follow, to cleave steadfastly to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, whatever road we are on, in the good times, in the marriages, the children, in the times of prosperity and in the bad times, in sickness and death, and in loss and overwhelming and crushing disappointment. At all times and in all places, we are to follow. And in following Jesus, we are told that we will be led home. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If I were not so, I would not have told you. In his second epistle and nearing his death, Peter writes in chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, and this is the complete Jewish Bible translation. God's power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowing the one who called us to his own glory and goodness. By these he has given us valuable and superlatively great promises so that through them you might come to share in God's nature and escape the corruption which evil desires have brought into the world. God's power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. We can live holy lives pleasing to God through God's power at work in us. We can follow Christ because the Holy Spirit empowers us to do so. That same Holy Spirit who empowered Peter to stand up in Jerusalem and preach with boldness is alive in us today. What a promise and what a miracle. We are never confident in ourselves. We are confident in our Lord in us. The entirety of John's gospel is a call, a call to behold, to believe, and to follow to look at Jesus, see his worth, believe that he is God's incarnate word, our atoning sacrifice, and then follow. Follow him, follow him always. These are written, this gospel was written, that you might believe, that you might behold, believe, and follow the one who died for you. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you so much um, for, for Jesus and for what we see of him in John's gospel. Lord, you are, you are so good to have provided one who knows us so well and when we fall restores us so lovingly, just as he did Peter on the beach. Lord, I pray for all the women here today that you would, and those that would watch this video, Lord, that you would empower them to follow you, to cleave steadfastly in good times and bad, knowing that you will lead them safely home, and home is always where you are. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.